For more than half a century, Luxembourg has been a center of excellence for international and cross-border financial services. Having flourished alongside European integration and the common European market, Luxembourg today acts as an EU hub and competence center to the world's leading financial institutions. Catering to the needs of global investors, the financial center provides a unique combination of international expertise, a complete toolbox of investment products, and highly specialized financial institutions and service providers. From wealth management, treasury and corporate banking to fund services, banks in Luxembourg have specialized in serving clients across borders. In Europe's leading fund center, asset managers find the perfect ecosystem to launch and distribute funds to investors across the world. Luxembourg's insurance industry has decades of experience in developing solutions to meet the needs of highly mobile citizens and multinational companies. A leading center for international debt listings, securitization and post-trade services, Luxembourg is the right place for companies to finance their global activities. English-speaking regulators and administrations, access to a multilingual and highly skilled workforce, a AAA-rated stable economy, an innovation-friendly digital nation, an international business environment right in the heart of the European continent. Luxembourg provides the ideal environment for international banks, asset managers and insurance companies to thrive within the European Union and beyond. Grow Beyond Borders, Luxembourg. Welcome to the China Finance Forum. Bringing together international experts and practitioners to discuss the macroeconomic, geopolitical and regulatory environment in which the global investment industry is operating. Ladies and gentlemen, Gui Guibin, Gui Lao Pang Yu. A warm welcome, wherever you are in the world, to the sixth edition of the China Finance Forum. My name is Judith Bogner, and once again, it's a great honor and pleasure to lead you through the event on behalf of Luxembourg for Finance. Now, due to ongoing precautions tied in with the pandemic, we have turned the usual analog conference into a two-day digital experience. So today and tomorrow we will be broadcasting live from our Luxembourg for Finance studio here in the Chamber of Commerce. And we're very grateful to the Chamber of Commerce for its hospitality. We also thank all our sponsors and media partners for their support. And we say thank you to our 25 expert speakers and moderators who are setting aside time to join us and share their insights on everything related to China finance. And we offer our gratitude to all of you who are joining us from around the world. We have some 730 registrations from 25 countries and we very much hope that you enjoy what we have to offer today and tomorrow. Now, I also want to be sure that you know that you can watch the stream either through the Luxembourg for Finance website or through WeChat. And if you happen to post a tweet or something on LinkedIn about the conference, please be sure to add the hashtag CFFL21 for the China Finance Forum so we can see your posts and tweets and also add the handle for Luxembourg for Finance at LuxFinance so we can all see your comments. And of course, everything will be recorded and the stream be made available later on on Luxembourg for Finance website so you can revisit all the interviews and panels as you wish. Now, in May 2021, the landscape for a conversation about uh, China finance is very different compared to the landscape back in October 2019 when the last China Finance Forum took place. While the world is, if you will, 
In year two of COVID-19, and many countries are still facing quite significant uncertainties, China has been emerging out of the pandemic ahead of other economies. Indeed, among the G20 last year, China was the only country that registered positive growth of 2.3% year on year. And for this year, the IMF expects China to bounce back to 8.4%. Now, of course, this dynamic has worldwide relevance because China's economy and its capital markets are increasingly integrated with the rest of the world. And this is what we're going to talk about today and tomorrow, how this integration is taking shape going forward. And just allow me to highlight a few themes that we're going to cover today and tomorrow. Thanks to growing trust in Chinese assets and its regulatory infrastructure, the internationalization of China's capital markets is continuing in leaps and bounds. Take, for example, last year when foreign investors poured more than 1 trillion renminbi into China's stocks and bonds, according to the FT. And also the success of dim sum bonds listed in Luxembourg is testimony to this growing trust and also testimony to Luxembourg's role in facilitating the internationalization of China's capital markets. And I can tell you a secret now, this is the reason why we chose today and tomorrow as dates for this year's China Finance Forum, because we want to mark and celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the first dim sum bond listing here at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Chains. And we have, of course, a special guest for that, that uh, who will join us tomorrow, Robert Schaffer, who is the former CEO of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. And another theme is, of course, climate action. You may remember in September last year when President Xi Jinping announced that China will strengthen its 2030 climate target, uh, aim to peak emissions before 2030 and aim to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. And we will also hear today and tomorrow how this commitment has been underpinned by action by China's central bank, the PBC. And then we have a very important milestone that occurred in last December when the Comprehensive Investment Agreement, the CAI, between Europe and China was concluded after eight years in, of negotiations. We'll discuss also the uh, outcome of this uh, conclusion. So today and tomorrow will be a lot about macro topics, about economic outlook, policy innovation, geopolitical complexities. We look at what the data tells us about the strength strengthening ties between China and Europe. I will also do a deep dive into China's growing digital economy and take the pulse of this ecosystem that is uh, e-commerce and fintech in China. And tomorrow we'll dedicate the day to more specifically financial topics such as the optimization of access channels to China's capital markets and certain hot investment themes such as ESG investing. But now, in keep with the tradition at the China Finance Forum, I have the great pleasure to invite to the digital floor the CEO of Luxembourg for Finance, Nicola Mackel, and Luxembourg's very own finance minister, Pierre Gramenia. Welcome, Nicola, and over to you. Dear Judith, uh, thank you very much for setting the frame for our conference. It is indeed the sixth conference that we organize on this. It was previously called the Luxembourg Renminbi Forum and uh, 2019 we renamed it the China Finance Forum, also to reflect the changing uh, nature of the topics. Indeed, over the last eight years when we have organized this conference, what we have seen is that the evolution of the issues that are of interest to our community, to our audience, has also enlarged. And that is why we would like to reflect that also in the title. I am particularly pleased that so many um, listeners are tuning in from many countries, certainly also from China, uh, but also from... Um, Africa. I've seen people from Nigeria and other African countries, from the US, of course, from Canada. So to all of you, a warm welcome. And 
What we try to do with this conference, as we have tried to do with the five previous editions of it, is to help promote understanding. Understanding of the issues and understanding of what the trade between China and Europe and the rest of the world is, where it is going, and what the framework is. So thank you also to all our speakers for taking the time and sharing their expertise with our audience. I'm particularly delighted now to be joined by Luxembourg's Minister of Finance, Pierre Gramigna, who is a, of course, loyal and regular uh, speaker at our conference. He has spoken at all of them. Um, we must somewhere uh, provide you and uh, bestow you a uh, medal of uh, loyalty to the Luxembourg uh, <coughs> China Finance Forum. But obviously, you are one of the main architects of our relations in the financial industry with China. And so in that sense, I'm particularly delighted. You have been Minister of Finance now for seven and a half years, nearly. Um, how many times have you visited China in your uh, years in office? Uh, well, I have stopped counting, honestly, uh, dear Nicola. Um, but uh, I think I've been going there a dozen times uh, over all these years. And I've been there all the years except last year uh, because of the pandemic. And I deeply regret it, but there was no other solution. And uh, it shows how important uh, it was for the government of Luxembourg to develop the bilateral relationship uh, with China in the field of finance, in the field of uh, fintech, in the field of sustainable finance. And a lot has happened in that period. So um, it was really worthwhile to go there so often. What has impressed you most about China uh, on all your different visits? I would say uh, three things. Uh, first, the use of uh, digital technology uh, in China in general and uh, for payment purposes in particular. Uh, in no place in the world have I seen uh, people paying with their smartphone uh, and this has become a commonplace. Uh, and in fact, it illustrates something that reminds me um, what people used to say uh, about China and, and other Asian countries in the past. They copy the US or they copy Europe. Now in this area, I think China is ahead of the pack and it is us copying them. Now, what uh, I want to say by that is we, we should really uh, try to just uh, be realistic about a relationship. Uh, and uh, in, in that area, China is ahead of us. The second thing that strikes me is connected to this one, and that is that uh, the People's Bank of China has, uh, in, in two areas, uh, developed a, a policy that, that is also, I think, a, a pioneering one. Number one is a, a, a digital yuan on which they have been working for five years and uh, they are really the central bank in the world that's most uh, advanced. And, and the other one is obviously also related with the People's Bank of China, sustainable finance. And uh, also this is an area that is close to my heart. And these three topics uh, really uh, are quite remarkable. China has been very successful at internationalizing its currency. And in also the last 10 years, there have been major reforms in opening up its capital market, attracting global investors. For most of this time, you have been finance minister. How exactly has this impacted the relationship between the People's Republic and the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg? Well, uh, I, I, I must say that uh, progress uh, of uh, the uh, phases of opening uh, the Chinese market and uh, um, densifying and deepening the bilateral relationship has been quite impressive. I remember back in 2014 uh, where my, my close team was explaining to me RQ fees. I, I had never heard of the word, uh, sorry for that, but I quickly understood what it meant. It was obviously a step-by-step -step approach to open uh, the market. I think it, it was um, 
uh, a very smart way of doing it. And then finally, the RQ fees disappeared quite quickly, much more quickly uh, than uh, anticipated. Um, I remember also a sentence uh, that the Chinese authorities said to me at the time because I thought that Luxembourg didn't have enough RQ fees. And they said to me, don't worry about the RQ fees, you have the business meaning that we were ahead of the curve, uh, that uh, we had been able to uh, attract uh, Chinese banks, uh, be it subsidiaries um, or branches in Luxembourg. Uh, and I must say that uh, when I started, we had three, uh, the three largest banks of China in Luxembourg. Now we have the seven largest uh, banks. Now uh, also some Chinese investors uh, have acquired uh, existing banks uh, in Europe. So um, what a difference a couple of years uh, make uh, that is seen from Luxembourg. The, the, other, the other decisive moment, I think, was when uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, currency, the, the renminbi, uh, was uh, uh, introduced in the special drawing rights of the IMF. Now, if you had told me in 2013, when I started as a finance minister, that that would happen in 2016, uh, I would have not believed it. So there has been an incredible acceleration uh, over time. And uh, we have built on that, uh, on that relationship uh, with many visits, uh, uh, also with some uh, multilateral initiatives. I think that Luxembourg uh, was uh, uh, also a driving engine in popularizing uh, the support to the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. Uh, we were the first European country to commit ourselves to participate and it gave me the great honor uh, for the uh, inauguration uh, to, to meet President Xi Jinping and to be one of the only three speakers on, on that inauguration ceremony. So that stays in, in my memory as an important milestone uh, on which to build. China's rise as an economic powerhouse has raised fears and is creating tensions between uh, China and the West. How does this impact the relations between China and Europe? If I look back, uh, what happened in the last 20 uh, years uh, China has developed uh, itself uh, very spectacularly in, in, in the production of goods, uh, but also in terms of financial services uh, and in terms of investment. Uh, probably uh, few people thought that China would so quickly become an important player in foreign direct investment as it became. Um, it was underestimated in the beginning uh, and uh, because the, the Chinese players have been so successful in investing in the United States, in Europe, in many areas of the world, also in Africa, by the way, um, the difference of treatment of uh, investment from China to Europe compared to the other way around became more obvious over time. Therefore, I am very, very pleased that uh, uh, at the end of last year uh, that the European Union and China could agree uh, on a bilateral uh, uh, agreement uh, to, to be a framework for the future. The idea behind this uh, uh, comprehensive uh, agreement on investment is to allow both sides to have equal opportunities in terms of investment. Now, I think that the Chinese government has um, made quite an effort to, to meet uh, the, the demands of Europe in this area. It, it is true that it was not totally reciprocal and so uh, it uh, warranted some changes. So I hope that uh, this uh, CAI agreement will soon uh, enter uh, into force. Uh, this uh, being said, um, I think that uh, there's a lot that we can develop between Europe uh, and China in many areas. I would like to highlight two areas. First, I would like to really welcome the fact that China has announced a few weeks ago that it is ready to commit itself uh, in uh, um, climate change uh, issues 
uh, by uh, saying that uh, it would go for zero emissions uh, by 2060, 10 years uh, after the European Union and a few others uh, in the Convention of Paris have agreed to do so. Uh, like it happens very often in the media, it was highlighted that it is 10 years later than others. What I would like to highlight is that China has taken a strong commitment in this area. And, and this is a game changer. Because I remember when I attended, and I was also the speaker for the European Union on that occasion, the Kyoto conference, I remember China and other countries saying, we are just watching what the developed countries will do in the future because we are not part of the exercise of reducing uh, the CO2 emissions because we are in an uptrend. We are just now really developing. Uh, and so we need uh, to use our potential so we cannot restrict our CO2 emissions. We are now 2021, that's 24 years after the Kyoto Conference in China, a obviously uh, uh, the second largest economy in the world commits itself to the goals of the Paris Convention. I think this is fundamental and it's extremely good news. And this, this, the second thing I would like to highlight is connected to this and that is that China uh, is playing an ever greater role uh, in promoting sustainable finance. Now, we know that in order to reach the climate goals, we will need to go from the billions to the trillions. Uh, and if we want to succeed in that, we need the private sector to be on board. It's not enough that uh, public uh, uh, investments happen. It's not enough that governments act. We need the private sector to act. And we need the banks to, to make sure that we can ensure this transition. And this is a difficult thing, and it will take decades. And uh, sustainable finance uh, is, is very close to my heart. I, I wear this pin on the uh, 17 um, uh, development goals of the United Nations. I have never worn a, a pin in my whole life, and uh, this one I, I now wear on an everyday basis because this is taking care of our planet, and finance plays a key role in that. And uh, also here, uh, I, I must say that the People's Bank of China has played a key role. I remember that Dr. Ma Jun came uh, for our uh, last uh, China Financial Forum to Luxembourg. Uh, I know that the representative of the People's Bank of China based in Frankfurt for Europe will be joining us and I would really like to salute that. And I see this as a really a major area of cooperation. And last but not least, obviously also the multilateral cooperation through the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. What a great project that is. And uh, I think we haven't used the full potential of that bank yet uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, I would like really to encourage all the partners uh, in that bank to, to work more closely together and also to involve the European Investment Bank, uh, which uh, is a little bit uh, the example and the predecessor of the AIIB to work more together. And as the EIB is based in Luxembourg, this is also obviously a very important development that we could foster. Minister, um, many critics of China urge Western governments and corporations to reduce and limit um, trade and investment with the People's Republic in order to get it to change certain policies. What is your answer to these critics? Um, I think uh, that uh, this comment of yours triggers uh, in my mind uh, uh, some uh, nostalgia of my Latin courses and I would like to paraphrase a, uh, a Latin say uh, and, and uh, apply it to today's world, uh, meaning uh, if you want peace, boost trade. So boosting trade is key. Now, we've seen in the last 20 years, especially in the last 20 years, uh, that uh, China has been extremely successful by first being welcomed in uh, the uh, World Trade Organization uh, and uh, taking full advantage of that, becoming uh, like the fabric of the world, you could say. 
Um, we are now working on having a more balanced relationship, as I mentioned before, on investments and uh, equal opportunities on, on both sides to invest in each other's uh, region. Uh, but uh, we need to continue to, to boost that trade. We have to redefine it a little bit, be smarter how we go about it. But the solution here is certainly not to try to reduce trade. Uh, we, we need to respect each other, uh, and uh, I think that's what Europe is trying to do. Now, we know that uh, in today's world, we have uh, three areas that, uh, that are the most important one in terms of economics. One is the United States, uh, the other one is China, and the third one is, is Euro Europe. And I think in, in Chinese culture, the tripod is a very strong symbol. Uh, because uh, the tripod uh, holds something uh, together uh, and uh, brings luck. So we need to work on that tripod all together or on this triangle. And I think the role of Europe here is key uh, in the sense that uh, geographically speaking, at least if you look at the map the old way with the Atlantic in the middle, we are in the middle between China and the US. Obviously, if you look at it from the, from the Pacific side, uh, we are a little bit left somewhere else on the planet. So let's make sure that we keep that image of Europe in the middle, trying also to, to bridge the gaps between uh, the other two partners. And I think the fact that we have now a new American president who believes in multilateralism is going to help us in that endeavor. Multilateralism stands for listening to each other and stands for dialogue. And that's what Europe stands for and specifically a small country like ours. So when are you going to go back to China? As soon as possible. So I really hope that I can go there uh, in the third or in the fourth quarter of this year. And I really look forward to it. Thank you very much, Minister Gramenia, for sharing these insights with our audience. And I now hand back to Judith for uh, the rest of the program with fantastic panel discussions and presentations on China's uh, economy, on the geopolitical context that the companies have to navigate, and then later on also on developments in the area of innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Gramenia and Nicolas Machels, for setting the scene truly for our further conversations. And I really appreciate that hopeful metaphor of the tripod for the future relationship between Europe, China and the United States. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our first keynote speaker from China. His name is Gao Dianxing. He's the chief representative of the People's Bank of China in Frankfurt. In this role, his responsibilities cover the Eurozone and the the Bank for International Settlement. Before coming to Frankfurt in 2017, he served at the International Finance Corporation in Washington, and prior to that, he worked with different development organizations in Latin America and Africa and the Caribbean on behalf of the PBC. Today, Gao Dinxing will speak to us about the PBC's economic outlook for China and its plans for innovation in the area of green finance, and something the minister just mentioned already, the digital renminbi. Welcome to the China Finance Forum, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Judith, for a kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to the sixth session of China Finance Forum. It is a great pleasure to be virtually here in Luxembourg. In this turbulent world of widespread COVID-19 pandemic, China's economy began to recover since the second half of last year and has become the only major economy in the world with a positive GDP growth in 2020. Real GDP growth by 2.3% last year with strong containment measures and effective macroeconomic policies put in place in a well-coordinated manner, the main economic indicators have rebounded sharply. In the first quarter of 2021, China's GDP growth reached 18.3% compared with that of the first quarter of last year, and 10.3% if compared with that of the first quarter of 2019, which is an average 
two-year growth of 5% at comparable prices. Looking ahead, we are aware that the pandemic is still spreading globally and the international landscape is complicated with high uncertainties and instabilities. Nevertheless, given that China's economy is mainly driven by domestic demand, the fundamentals underlying its indigenous growth drivers and its long-term prospect of steady economic growth remain unchanged. China's recovery is expected to grow in 2021 with the overall GDP growth for the whole year projected to be over 6%. China will keep its macroeconomic policies consistent, stable, and sustainable with a pr prudent monetary policy that is flexible, precise, reasonable, and moderate. A proper balance will be achieved between supporting the recovery and containing risks. Structural monetary policy tools will play their roles in targeted liquidity provision with more financial support to be extended to scientific and technological innovation, micro and small businesses, and green development. In recent years, topics like CBDC, the central bank digital currency, and green finance have attracted great attention from both the financial sector and the general public. Next, I would like to share some brief information on the current development in those two areas in China. China was the first major economy to start exploring its own digital currency as early as 2014. So far, there is no timetable for the official nationwide rollout of the digital renminbi yet. Digital renminbi, or ECNY, it is now formally called, is the legal tender in digital form. Last year, the pilot program of the use of digital renminbi began in four cities in China, namely Shenzhen, Suzhou, Xiong'an, and Chengdu. In October 2020, Shenzhen municipal government carried out a lottery to give away a total of 10 million yuan worth in digital form. Nearly 2 million people applied and 50,000 won. The winners downloaded a digital renminbi app, received the digital yuan with a face value of 200 each, which they could spend at over 3,000 merchant shops in a particular district in Shenzhen. Transaction types have become more diverse as testing has progressed. In the first several pilot programs, the digital renminbi could only be used in brick and mortar shops. Subsequent tests have included online shopping, online car hailing, phone-free hardware wallets, and ATM machines. Since the start of this year, the pilot program is picking up speed. Six new regions for the trial use have been confirmed, and cities like Shanghai, Hainan, Changsha, Xi'an, Qingdao, and Dalian are added to the list. For the upcoming Beijing Olympics uh, in winter uh, next year, ECNY will also be made available not only to domestic users, but also to international athletes and visitors. Digital renminbi and banknotes will coexist as legal tender for a long time. And PBC, as the central bank, does not intend to replace the functions of commercial banks. So in the design, the distribution of the digital renminbi will involve a two-tiered wholesale system. It will be dispensed from the central bank to commercial banks, telecommunication operators, and online payment providers, which will then be responsible for disseminating the currency into consumers' hands. In addition, PVC doesn't want to replace the existing payment giants like Alipay or WeChat Pay either. Those are financial platforms playing the role of wallets, while the digital yuan is the content in the wallet. Controllable anonymity is an important feature of digital renminbi. If too much emphasis is placed on anonymity, digital currency may be targeted by criminals and becomes an illegal trading tool for activities such as money laundering, terrorism financing, and drug dealings. Digital currency has to meet the requirements for anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism financing, and anti-tax evasion. Otherwise, its legitimacy will be in doubt. As PBC's Deputy Governor Mr. Lee Bo mentioned in the latest Ball Forum, three things need to be done before adopting nation, nationwide the use of digital renminbi. The first is to continue with the various pilot programs and expand the testing scope. The second is to further develop the infrastructure for the digital currency, including the ecosystem, and to improve the safety and reliability of the system. The third is to establish a legal and a regulatory framework to regulate the use of digital renminbi. 
the key task at present is to promote the domestic use of digital MMB. The intention of launching digital MMB is not to use it for cross-border payments, which involves many other complicated issues, nor is the goal to replace US dollar or other international currencies. Another topic is about the green finance development in China. The international community is forming a broad consensus on tackling climate change. China has announced the goal of peaking climate emissions by 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, also known as the 3060 goal. This requires a comprehensive economic transition and green finance is an important part in this process. By the end of 2020, green loans and green bonds in China totaled 1.8 trillion US dollars and 125 billion US dollars respectively, ranking as the first largest and second largest. More than 40 carbon neutral bonds have been issued with a total volume of over 10 billion US dollars. The 3060 goal has set a higher bar for the Chinese financial sector. To meet this goal, we need to overcome a host of challenges on many fronts. On the society front, public awareness of emission reduction has to be raised. On the market front, the carbon market has to play a greater role in price discovery. Only when carbon emission is priced in can we achieve effective resources allocation. China's carbon market is still in its initial stage and its financial nature needs to be further clarified. On the institutional front, climate information disclosure needs to be improved. The disclosure should be expanded to cover listed companies, financial institutions, and other market players, and the move from a voluntary to a compulsory basis. And lastly, on the risk management front, there needs to be greater attention to, be, to the fossil fuel-related transition risks. Fossil fuels, mainly coal, account for 80% of China's cons energy consumption. By 2060, this ratio is expected to fall below 20%. China's financial institutions have invested heavily in carbon intensive assets and the risk for asset price adjustment caused by the green transition must be closely monitored. Looking forward, progress needs to be made in the following three areas. First, we must mobilize public and private funds to support the green economy in line with market principles. It is estimated that by 2030, China will need to invest 2.2 trillion yuan per year to reduce carbon emissions. And this amount will further grow to 3.9 trillion yuan from 2030 to 2060. Government funding alone is far from enough. We need to encourage more private capital participation. To do this, we need to lay the groundwork on two fronts. One is about information disclosure. PBC plans to set up a mandatory disclosure system with uniform standards and promote great information sharing between financial institutions and companies. The other is about green finance taxonomy. Last month, on April the 21st, China finished the revision of the Green Bond Endorsed Project Catalog, which is a set of fundamental standards for selecting appropriate investment targets for green bonds. It removed fossil fuel projects from the list, which is an action that made the catalog consistent with international rules. PBC is now working with our EU counterparts to harmonize taxonomy and plans to announce a common taxonomy later this year. Central banks have a role to play in providing policy incentives. PBC plans to launch a support toolkit to provide low-cost funds for carbon emission reduction. PBC will also support green finance through a host of measures ranging from commercial credit ratings, deposit insurance rates, collaterals for open market operations. Second, we must evaluate the potential impact on climate change on financial stability. To move from carbon peak to net zero, it will take 70 years for Euro, uh, for the EU, 45 years for the US, and only about 30 years for China. This time is, the time is shorter and the curve is much steeper. It means China's financial institutions are faced with grave risks and should be, begin their transition right away. PBC is looking at the possibility of including climate factors in financial stress tests and gradually incorporating climate risks into the macro prudential policy framework. PBC is reviewing green loan, green bond performance of financial institutions on a quarterly basis 
the financial institutions are encouraged to evaluate and manage the environmental and climate risks. Third, we must let the carbon market play its role of price discovery. China's national emission trading system will be up and running by the end of June this year. The carbon market should be a financial market in nature and allow the trading of carbon financial derivatives. This will make sure that all risks are fully priced in so that the carbon price plays a better role of serving either as an incentive or as a constraint. International coordination matters a lot if we are to succeed in the above undertakings. During China's G20 presidency in 2016, PBC initiated and co-chaired the Sustainable Finance Study Group. It contributed to building international consensus on green finance. Resumed under the Italian presidency this year, the study group is now co-chaired by PBC and the U.S. Treasury Department and has been elevated to a working group level. We will enhance coordination with all G20 members when discussing the roadmap for promoting sustainable finance, information disclosure, and the taxonomy on green finance. Meanwhile, PBC will continue to deepen cooperation under the Network for Greening Financial System, the NGFS, the International Platform on Sustainable Finance, IPSF, and other multilateral frameworks. In a nutshell, the financial system can play a key role in supporting green transition and managing climate-related risks. Going forward, PBC will continue to support green and higher quality development and contribute its share to the 3060 goal. Thank you for your kind attention, and I wish the forum in the next two days a great success. Thank you very much, Gao Dinxin, Chief Representative of the People's Bank of China in Frankfurt. And now let's go back to this rebalancing of the relationship between Europe and China and what the data tells us about the strengthening ties between both regions. And I have the pleasure to welcome for that another speaker. He is Darius Yastani, partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers and indeed leads the Global Market Research Center. So welcome to the Luxembourg for Finance Studio, Darius. Good to have you with us. So I know you've done some number crunching on behalf of Luxembourg for Finance. What does the data show us about those ties between Europe and China? Sure, Judith. It's an interesting question. And let me start by saying that the relationship between China and EU has been a long and fruitful one. And that has been demonstrated also by the fact of the growing interconnectedness between the financial services of the two regions, which has bolstered strong inflows. And I'm very, very confident that if we are able to overcome the current political and regulatory challenges, these ties will grow even stronger. And overall, as well as for the financial services industry within the two regions. Now, um, as the previously it was mentioned, China has overtaken U.S. as being the largest trade partner of EU since 2020. Let's have a look at how these trade and finance relationships have grown. And one factor is the FDI. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we can see that the stock of FDI has grown over time. And while you're looking at the time period between 2013 and 2018, when we look at the foreign direct investment from EU to China, we see that that growth has been around about 7% compounded annual growth rate over this five-year time period. And from China into EU, it has been an impressive CAGR of 21.8%. Now let's put it in perspective. If we look at the overall GDP growth during this time period for EU on an annual basis, it was lower than 3%. If we look at China, within the same time period on an annual basis, the GDP growth was lower than 8%. And we are sure that once 
there is a huge potential for the FDI to grow further only if we compare the economic magnitude of both of those regions. Now, FDI is what I call a sticky investment. If we move on to the next slide, uh, because it is long-term and hence it is prone um, to any political shifts or regulatory shifts. Whereas when we look at the portfolio investments, which are more liquid and easier to invest and divest, we see again this strong growing relationship between the two regions. And it shows also within the asset management industry. So if you look at the portfolio investments between EU and China, and I will again, although you are looking at a longer time period, I will take the same time period between 2013 and 2018, you see that the compounded annual growth between EU and China portfolio investments, so EU into China portfolio investments, have grown at a more than an 8% compounded annual growth rate, and vice versa, which means China into EU, the portfolio growth has been above 15%. Now, um, if we look at it a bit more into the investment funds area, and if we should move further, on the next slide, please, um, we see, so just going back to the portfolio investments, you can see that the portfolio investments from China to EU actually are very, very balanced between equities and debt securities, uh, both around 130.9 billion and 137 billion. When we look at it other way around EU to China, um, uh, and if we move on to the next slide, we will see um, that here the preference for Europeans investing into China, it is more on the equity sides and investment fund shares and less on the debt security side. And when we focus a little bit more on the mutual fund side, if we go to the next slide, we will see that you can see here that already Europe makes the major share of mutual funds that invest into China with above 56%. And even on the QFII quota breakdown, when we look at it from a regional perspective, Europe is only second to Asia. Hence, for investments, portfolio investments into China, Europe leads, and as you know already from a mutual fund perspective, Luxembourg bears a major share with almost 80% of the funds that invest into China. Now, given that I have a short period of time uh, of 10 minutes, and I'll be short and sweet, if we move on and look at quickly at some other sectors, and if we move to the next slide, these are the Chinese insurance assets. And I wanted to demonstrate the magnitude of, of the insurance industry in China. Now, we have had, with some openings in China, Allianz and AXA, for example, um, taking over full control of their ventures in China. And we have some other European insurers who have teamed up with Chinese corporates in order to provide um, decent insurance products or good insurance products to, um, to that economy. Again, we believe that with further opening, there is a huge potential for growth within this industry also, uh, both in China as well as uh, for Chinese insurance companies into uh, Europe. We move, as we move along into the banking sector, um, it was already mentioned seven of the largest banks in China have already operations in Europe. Uh, and more specifically, they have also their headquarters uh, in Luxembourg. Um, and again, China, to, to, to just have that magnitude, yeah? China is one of the largest banking uh, systems in the world, uh, overtaking US some times ago. And we have seen also on the flip side that European banks have invested into China, such as Deutsche Bank, BNP, um, and others. And we believe that with further opening, 
we will see a more interconnectedness also within the insurance and the banking sectors. Uh, in addition to what we are seeing, a strong interconnectedness on the asset management side, which was demonstrated by the portfolio uh, investments. Now, to summarize and close as I reach um, the end of my uh, speech, um, I would say that there is a strong potential to further strengthen the Sino-European relationship. And there is a huge potential of growth for both financial services industries as we overcome the political and regulatory challenges and the opening of China. And I encourage you to go on the LFF side to download the report and read it in more details. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darius. Darius Shiastani there from PwC here in Luxembourg. And I think what we just saw shows the strengthening of ties between Europe and China in quite impressive ways. And we'll drill down more deeply into that data and the financial topics such as access channels and investment themes tomorrow with our specialists on the second day of the China Finance Forum. But now let's hear what our first panel makes of those geopolitical complexities Darish was just mentioning, uh, together with my colleague who's the moderator for this panel, a warm welcome to James King, a familiar face for attendees of the China Finance Forum. Um, he's, of course, the FT's Global China editor and uh, based in Hong Kong from where he joins us now. A warm welcome to you, James. Good to have you. And over to you. James, I think you need to switch on your mic, maybe. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Here we go. Apologies. No worries Apologies, at all. everyone. Um, thanks very much, Judith. It's a great pleasure to be here, virtually at least. And I think we've got a really special panel uh, to kick off with today. Let me first give an overview of the theme um, before introducing the panelists. Uh, this panel is called Navigating the Geopolitical Triangle China, Europe, and the US in an uncertain age. It will be apparent to anyone who follows China's relations with the world that ties between China and the US have got a lot worse in the last two or three years. This deteriorating relationship has also impacted the EU's ties with China, which even independent of the US have become more tense. One of the key issues has been Xinjiang. In March this year, the EU, the US, the UK and Canada imposed sanctions on some Chinese officials over human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Beijing retaliated by imposing sanctions on some EU lawmakers and also on the EU's main foreign policy decision-making body and two institutes. One big question flowing from this is where the relationship goes from here. And another more specific question is over the impact that these tensions may have on the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on, on Investment, which we will call CAI from now on, which was agreed late last year, but has not so far been ratified. And some people believe that that agreement may never actually go into force. As I said, we've got a really stellar panel to discuss this. Uh, Professor Yan Xuetong is Dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University and also Secretary General of the World Peace Forum. He's well known as one of the leading commentators on China and its relations with the outside world. Jörg Wutka is similarly a, a luminary in Europe's relations with China, particularly in the commercial sphere. He is president of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, 
uh, an office he's also held on two previous occasions. Jörg is also chief representative of BA BASF China. He's based in Beijing, but joining us today from Shanghai. Agatha Kratz is associate director of the Rhodium Group, um, one of the world's leading consultancies on China. Agatha coordinates Rhodium Group's European activities and leads research on European Union, China relations and China's commercial diplomacy. We're going to try to go until 10.15 Luxembourg time on this panel, so it'll be a little bit truncated, but Agatha, could I come to you first, please? How do you see this complex picture between the US, US the EU and China playing out? Thanks, James. And I want to make sure everyone can hear me uh, just to, it's perfect. Here you go. Um, thanks, James. This is, a, this is a good question. I think the topic of the, the whole panel is a really relevant one. The geopolitical context at the moment for companies, businesses um, is an extremely complex one, maybe the riskiest in 20 years, really. Uh, front and center in the news, you've said that has been the quick degradation of US-China relation, which has created what you could call a whole new world for US, but also European firms active in China. Many had hoped that the US could revert back or at least, you know, maybe slow down the pace of decoupling and escalation under a new, more traditional administration in place, you know, under Biden. But by now, you know, about 100 days into the Biden uh, presidency, it's clear that it's not the case. Uh, and, and those hopes have been pretty much set aside. There's no reset. There's no rekindling of the engagement, even around issues uh, of climate. Uh, we've spoken about that a little bit earlier, but those are baby steps rather than giant steps. Uh, there's also no bargain, grand bargain anymore. There was a, a sort of engagement under Trump, uh, a, a sort of transactional relationship that's not there anymore. And so you've got instead what I like to call a, a pretty sharp form of hawkey, hawkish pragmatism that's emerging around four driving principles, extreme competition at its core, engagement with China, but only limited if in US interest and not for its own sake anymore. A much more principled tone, you spoke about human rights, you spoke about Xinjiang, this is now front and center as well in, in the Biden policy, much more than before. And then you've got much more efforts to align partners, allies, uh, onto US's policy direction. And so as a result of that, this administration, the Biden administration, and that's that's my take, but um, I'm interested to hear what other things, uh, this US administration could actually turn up to be even more disruptive for US-China relations. Of course, relations won't be more volatile than they were in the past. Policy won't be as unpredictable as it was in the past, but you're facing here a team that's animated by pretty much exactly the same belief that conditions in China do not permit much engagement. And on the other hand, you've got a team that is actually much more experienced, equipped with a lot of tools that the Trump administration wasn't using, and is working to deploy those tools with the lattice. So there might actually be more disruption than less disruption in the future. Uh, and it could lead to more constraints on businesses in terms of trade, investment, their ability to do R&D across borders, and a, a likelihood, especially around human rights issue, to be caught in the middle. So the environment on the US side of things is really fraught and really risky at the moment. Now, what you said, James, which is really important, is that it's also getting more complicated on the other side of the Atlantic in the EU. And you've, you've cited a few of those. Interestingly, you know, it has actually been getting more complicated and the situation has changed for about as long as the US-China relation has been changing the past five, six years. Um, the EU has been pursuing a pretty similarly defensive agenda on China for the, all of those years out of two realizations that are pretty similar to the US. First, that many aspects of China's economic model and political model were spilling over to the European markets and destabilizing and or you know, uh, uh, favoring Chinese firms over European firms. And second, uh, the realization that Europe's approach might be outdated, too much engagement, not enough defensiveness, uh, and so that that needed to be rekindled. So a lot of work has actually started, you know, the past few years under the Juncker Commission and is now continuing under the von der Leyen Commission with a much more diverse approach, not just cooperating, but competing and even being rivals on certain issues. Of course, this has been more measured, progressive than it has been in the US and maybe less disruptive for business, but it's not risk-free. And this is really something I want to underline here. A lot of action has already been taken in terms of investment screening, export controls. Also, you know, we've just seen a new instrument to deal with Chinese subsidies and even a rekindling of industrial policy programs 
of course, in the US as well, but certainly in the EU. On top of that, the past year, and you spoke about that with DCAI, um, there's there's a real strong change around the political mood uh, around the EU-China relationship. Because in, in addition to the policy mood changing, you've had a change in public opinion with much more negative opinions of China building up in Europe, uh, which is forcing European leaders putting them in a very uncomfortable situation where they absolutely want to keep the door open to China, keep business open. They want to preserve that relationship with the second biggest economy, fastest growing economy in the world. But they are also pressed at home to take a tougher stance on Beijing. And that's actually probably one of the biggest sources of risk at the moment. Uh, on Kai, this is a great illustration. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, although the, the agreement was welcomed by business at the end of December, there was a lot of pu public pushback. Uh, especially around labor rights provision. And so, you know, to balance out this push for engagement, European policymakers probably felt they had to move and they had to show that they were also able to be tough uh, by imposing sanctions. Now, that blew back pretty drastically, didn't it? And you have now counter sanctions, which, is, which are making it much more unlikely that the agreement will be passed. So just wanted to stop there, but just say the balancing act in Europe is extremely risky as well, and everyone has their eyes on the US. But what's happening in the U in Europe at the moment is also bearing risk for our businesses. Thank you very much, Agatha. Now, uh, York, uh, turning to you, I mean, uh, there can be few people in the world with a vantage point like yours. Could you tell us what you think the latest thinking is on whether the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment can or will be ratified and uh, and whether it can actually finally take effect. Well, thanks, James. First, I would like to thank for being invited. Uh, I was at the first RMB forum. It's obviously more fun to be in Luxembourg and enjoying the Luxembourg Riesling than doing this from Shanghai here. Um, but uh, anyhow, I mean, Agassa has done me a great favor. She has basically outlined the issues. Uh, um, I would say that uh, the investment agreement is pretty much in the ICU, and I don't see that it's coming out uh, for a long period of time. Um, the investment agreement was very much looked forward to by the uh, business community here. I'm representing European business, which is 1,700 members across uh, seven regions, and uh, seven years of negotiations were basically destroyed three months after the political agreement uh, was signed. Now, how the hell could this happen? Well, I mean, sanctions uh, were uh, basically installed, uh, Europe, uh, America versus China, China versus America, same Europe against China, and then came this complete uh, bazooka style of uh, sanctions against <laughs> Europe, uh, which I guess has really derailed the ratification process for a long period of time. Five parliamentarians in the European Parliament were sanctioned, five out of six parties, uh, and I'm not kidding when I say we are talking about years of delay here, um, which is a great pity. And I don't see any political capital <laughs> space either in Europe or here in China that actually someone could make the move to lift sanctions. I'm totally opposed to sanctions. It's very easy to please your domestic uh, audience coming up with sanctions, but it's damn difficult in order to lift them again. So we have a situation where, of course, Europe expects China to move first because of the asymmetric uh, uh, way of means that it was installed. And, of course, Beijing being in the primaries, 100 years of Communist Party, next year's Party Congress, there's no appetite to compromise as well. So as I'm sitting here, we carry on doing our business as we did for the last years, but definitely it was a hit uh, because we were very much looking forward to this investment agreement being ratified. And frankly, being uh, fa facing elections in Germany in September and in Paris uh, in April next year, um, given this, as I was saying, the public opinion, you know, our democratically elected leaders do look at opinion polls. Um, I see virtually no room for anybody to move. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, quite a stark picture. Professor Yen, uh, could I come to you, please? Uh, would you be able to give a sense of, from the Chinese side of how Beijing views its relationship with Europe and, of course, the EU, um, and in particular, whether the recent tensions that I've been outlining and, and the other panellists have out outlined can be overcome? 
Well, uh, thank you for the question. I think the, uh, the relationship between the China and the Europe and uh, quite influenced by China-US competition. And uh, European position in some way and uh, uh, influenced a lot uh, uh, by Biden's policy towards the, uh, uh, Europe. And uh, why China and the uh, EU can reach that uh, investment agreement, mainly because uh, Trump is too unfriendly to Europe. And so that's a big uh, engine driving the uh, Europe to agree with China on this uh, investment. But uh, when Biden came to power, he adopted a different policy towards uh, uh, American traditional allies. So Europeans feel less pressure or stricter pressure from the uh, US and find that they can be more co strategic cooperation with the US, so they become uh, hesitant on this uh, uh, further uh, economic cooperation with the China. That's the yeah. uh, 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 understanding from the uh, uh, Chinese perspective. Second is that, and uh, personally, I don't worry about this, uh, uh, the treaty very much. And we must understand that China and the EU's economic relationship have developed without this treaty in the last several decades. That means uh, no matter the, the treaty ratified or not, the economic relationship between China and the US heavily based on the business. That means uh, how much Chinese uh, businessmen and the European entrepreneurs can benefit from their uh, cooperation or from their uh, uh, business. So from my standing, in the digital age, just now people are dis discuss about the digital life in China because the digital life in China moving faster than that in the Europe from understanding the economical cooperation between China and Europe will continue. And uh, it may be uh, uh, face some uh, political problems, but uh, it, in general, it will move forward rather than to step back. That's the point is that. How can we make this uh, uh, econ economic relations between the China and Europe move uh, a little bit smoothly from understanding the political sanitization is the most important. And uh, as long as the businessmen and uh, to depoliticize uh, de their business from the political uh, issues or political disputes or ideological conflicts between China and Europe, and then this business and the economic uh, uh, affairs and the kind of making progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yen. Could I st stay with you, please? Um, you, you wrote a paper last year in which you were talking about the chances that the US and China could enter a new Cold War. And now that you've had a chance to evaluate the first 100 days of President Joe Biden, do you think that a, a new Cold War is likely or can it be avoided? Uh, my opinion is very clear. I published an article in Foreign Affairs under the title Uneasy Peace. In that article, I strongly defined uh, or make a, a argued that there's an impossible to have a Cold War. Cold War is a kind of a special major power rivalry in a, uh, under uh, specific conditions. Nowadays, uh, there's a, this kind of conditions uh, already disappear, and there's no way to have a Cold War. And uh, the ideological competition is not the core engine to driving China and the US policies. Second, the economic, integration, uh, economic relations between China and the rest of the world make the Cold War uh, strategy or the containment strategy and uh, ineffective. And third, I think it's also most important thing is that we are moving into the digital age. In this age, uh, people live in the cyber side and uh, the cyber uh, cyberspace, and the competition in cyberspace is not in nature space. And I thought we can have a uh, move the cold war from the nature space into the cyberspace. The reason is very simple because the life in cyberspace is so fundamentally different from the nature uh, uh, strategic competition in nature space. Major powers no longer need to control the uh, 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 the the, the land, uh, the uh, sea, and water, and uh, uh, the strategic uh, geo uh, geographic uh, geopolitical positions. They just need uh, to obtain the digital technology superiority. So this make a cold war. Thank you very much.
Right. That's so very clear. If I may, um, all of these tensions that, that the panelists have, have been describing um, create a real dilemma for European companies and, of course, U.S. companies for that matter, which is whether or not they will get caught up in the tensions between the U.S. and China and whether their business in China will be held to ransom over some political considerations. What's your view on this? And is there any way that companies can avoid catching the, the sort of trilateral flack? Me? Is it me, huh? To, to, to Agatha, please. Agatha, Agatha okay. you here? So, sorry, sorry, Jörg, but I would love to have your answer to that question too, actually. Um, well, the, the first answer, James, is that they're already getting caught in the middle, right? Um, and that started four or five years ago when the US started putting measures in place on trade and tariffs. You had a little bit of tit for tat, but most of that came from the US. The measures on investment, major measures on, on R&D, and all of that already put... European companies in a hard place because they had to manage and develop a strategy for managing especially their IP, their intellectual production and property much better. And so you, you've already seen the past four years um, a lot of thinking around how to reorganize um, R&D capacities, investments, assets, etc. And that's getting stronger. You know, it, it used to be very economic, but now with human rights um, human rights issue being put at the center of uh, U.S. policy. This is expanding to uh, value chains when they have an impact on human rights. This is expanding to sustainability of certain production chains, et cetera, et cetera. So that's happening in any case. I would say there are two factors that make this even more risky and, and, and even more pressing at the moment. We spoke about that. The politicization of EU-China relations means that, you know, for, for a long time, EU businesses, when they got caught in China in U.S.-China tensions or just uh, some kind of a flare-up in, in, in tension even between the EU and China could somehow wait it out. Um, they would kind of go low for a moment and they would just hope that things would, would um, kind of stabilize. At the moment, there's so much increase in public attention, politicization around the EU-China relationship that it's not enough and it's not okay for business anymore to just lay back. Uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on them to actually make statements, make choices and and... So they're getting caught in the middle here, even more so than in the past. And in addition to that, that's the that's the last point. You see uh, not just the EU, not just the US situation changing, but you see the Chinese government, you know, developing tools also to deal with extraterritoriality. And so you've got a legal environment that's also making it even more complicated for European businesses when they're in China, because you've got the US telling them to do something, but you've got legal uh, legal context in China that's telling them not to do it. And so this is only going to get worse, and this is only going to get more complicated in the future. Thanks very much, Agatha. And Jörg, uh, coming to you, and probably this may be the last question that we have time for, but I would be very interested, as Agatha said, to hear your view about uh, European companies that may feel they're caught in the middle, you know, what can they do? Uh, and secondly, um, I think it would be very interesting to hear from you about the general operating environment these days in China. Presumably the pandemic is past and a lot of European companies are doing really good business there. Indeed, uh, we get caught in the middle anyways. Uh, but looking back over the last four years, uh, US-China relationships politically very, very bad. The Chinese uh, government went the extra mile in order to make life comfortable for the U.S. investors. Uh, all the, my colleagues uh, from ExxonMobil, General Motors, uh, nothing to complain. Uh, the same, I think, is going to happen to us. Uh, there will be a very toxic uh, political environment. But frankly, uh, it's very clear that China wants European business investment here the more the merry. And one of the symbolic meetings was, of course, during the week of the sanctions, Prime Minister Li Keqiang visiting uh, my factory in uh, Nanjing indicated very clearly that uh, there's supposed to be more investment. Of course, there will be always the occasional company being chased down the road. I mean, H&M is one of these unfortunate cases that, of course, uh, causes a lot of pain, I think, long term. 
um, and, and it triggers the idea maybe uh, that uh, uh, it is okay in order to single out a company uh, like that. But at the same time, uh, we, I think, uh, as Professor also said, it's being compartmentalized. We're doing good business. China stands for 30% of global growth. So I'm very positive on this one. Now, I really would like to have a commercial in between. Uh, as, uh, as you know, we came up with a report in January, uh, the decoupling report, and it shows three flags. And you can see how U.S. and China is falling apart, how the U.S. and uh, China has stress points, and how U.S. and Europe also had stress points. And if you can see these uh, patches here, uh, that's Joe Biden. Uh, that is basically uh, uh, the new administration being able to patch it up. Uh, what has been done during the Trump administration. We really, in this report, outlined the dangers for everyone about decoupling. Nobody wins. We are all in there for more complexity. Uh, we don't like it. And hence, uh, we have a very uh, a deep uh, analysis on tech decoupling, not financial, not trade, um, and uh, software and semiconductors, of course. So I guess that's a real worry for us, but it's not too late yet for our leaders uh, to to say something, as you said, last point. Um, you know, uh, we had an incredible year. Um, I was asked a lot last year in, in February, March. You know, are you going to diversify from China? Uh, I can only look back and say, you know, luckily we did not. China has stabilized our headquarters. Uh, virtually all manufacturing companies went for a double digit growth. Uh, my company included, and uh, it has been a very successful year. And I think that translates for the rest of the year that actually um, it's it's going to be very strong. I mean, China is at $10,000 per capita um, GDP. Uh, the U.S. is at 65000 So China has a lot of catch-up to do. And hence, in my business in chemicals, we're putting up this $10 billion investment in Guangdong because uh, China stands for 60% of chemical growth. So what I'm always trying to say is if you are not at the table, you're going to be on the menu. But is it easy? Of course not. And that's, again, my second commercial. Uh, we are publishing year, uh, every year this position paper. Um, and this position paper basically is the outlining issues of what is to be reformed here. Um, it's, by the way, requested reading in capitals, but also in Beijing. And to give you a taste for it, it has a cool 430 pages and 900 case studies. It just gives you a taste of how difficult it is to operate here. Definitely, one thing is clear, you have to be in China to be a global company. Thank you very much, Jörg. A, a brilliant uh, summary of how, how it is in China these days for European companies. I would say, obviously, the business is, is very good for many of them, but the politics are very, very tricky and look likely to become more so. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to our excellent panel, uh, to yourself, York, to Professor Yen, and to Agatha. Um, I think a couple of you have to head off now. So thanks so much for the panel, and I'm handing back to Judith. Thanks to, thank you so very much, James King there um, in Hong Kong with his terrific panelists, Agatha Kratzio, Wutka, and Professor Yuan Shi Tong. And I can promise you, you're glad we will put aside that bottle of Riesling for the next time you'll be over in Luxembourg. It will be chilled and ready for you. Now, let's move on with the ec economists. So the economic panel is probably going to echo what we just heard from Jörg Wutka about the truly dynamic economic economic picture that is uh, unfolding in front of our eyes in, in China. Now, China was, of course, the first major economy to emerge out of the uh, repercussions of the crisis. If we just look back to the first quarter last year, we saw that GDP contracted, yes, quite sharply, as to uh, about 6.8 percent. But then it quickly picked up speed through the following quarters into a V-shaped recovery, as it's called. And eventually, among the G20, China was the only country with positive growth of 2.3%. And as we heard earlier, uh, China's central bank, the PBC, is projecting growth for this year to come in above 6%. So to discuss China's economic outlook, I now have the pleasure to introduce our three esteemed economists. We have Ginny Yang joining us from Hong Kong. She is Chief China Economist at ICE 
the ICBC standard and leads its China markets team, um, its China markets strategy and research team. And then, of course, a familiar face for all attendees at the China Finance Forum. We have Frederick Neumann joining us from Hong Kong. He's managing director and co-head of uh, Asian economics at HSBC. Hong Kong. And then a new face joining us from New York, although he spends a fair amount of time in Beijing. Arthur Kroeber, welcome to you. He's a founding partner and managing director at Gave Called Dragonomics and the editor of its journal, China Economic Quarterly. He will be joining us by telephone. So welcome to all of you. A warm welcome to all three of you to the China Finance Forum 2021. And the first question I want to put to all of you con concerns the developments in China's domestic economy. Now we see recovery racing ahead of other countries, especially in the first quarter. We had a record growth rate of 18.3%. That's likely to be less in the following quarters. But in light of this dynamic development, Frederick, first to you. What sort of um, developments are you keeping an eye on in the domestic economy in China? And what may be different compared to the pre-COVID era? Well, this year, there are really two big uh, things happening in the economy. The first one is that despite the very strong headline numbers you just cited, Actually, there's some evidence that perhaps sequentially the economy is cooling a little bit. Uh, we had very strong growth last year, but the officials are tugging the reins a little bit. Uh, we see slowing credit growth, for example. And so sequentially, there's a bit of a slowdown uh, coming through in the economy. But that's not the big story. The big story actually is more of rotation and growth. So we had last year very strong investment, uh, construction, the property sector, for example, in infrastructure. This year, the hope is that the consumer side will spring back to life, the services sector, and that that really takes over as the main driver of the economy. Whether that will happen, though, that's going to be the key question over the next few quarters. And if it doesn't, uh, if the consumer doesn't step up in China, then there's actually a risk of a bit of a sharper slowdown than perhaps many currently expect. Terrific. So uh, the top story is not like some others are saying, we need to keep an eye on inflation and there's this dynamic growth in China, but actually uh, a, a rotation of growth. Let's hear from Ginny what her take is on what we are observing there. I absolutely agree with Frederick's view about consumption becoming a bigger driver of growth. And I really have three key observations in terms of post-COVID, how China this year and during the next uh, a few years will pan out and think more carefully about the growth engines. Number one is responsible growth. We know that China doesn't just want a one-off growth figure of above 6%, even 8%. What China is increasingly seeking is a sustainable rate of growth. And to be able to measure that is whether this growth is having a beneficial impact, not only on the domestic economy, but also internationally. So responsible in a sense of the environment, social, social inequality is an issue, but also governance, the real contrast between regulation versus innovation. So really removing those um, obstacles, I guess, towards it, you know, um, it, it, some of those greatest structural challenges that really can hold back China's growth model. Secondly, agile, being able to really have the flexibility um, to really tweak some of those monetary and fiscal uh, policies in light of a longer term vision is hugely important. Um, so obviously the growth targets, uh, as we see for the first time, we don't have a numerical growth target as such, but we do have much more social uh, qualities such as uh, job figures uh, and other types of measures. And last but not least, inclusive growth. 
growth. And that really has a very broad umbrella. But really, what we saw um, during the aftermath of, of quarter one last year was, in fact, the SMEs, uh, those that tend to be excluded from China's growth, really having um, seeing a huge amount of policy objectives that really being targeted at those. So I think that will be very important. And of course, last but not least, capital account opening. The reason for that, it, we will come on to, I'm sure, dual circulation, but how to embrace the international financial and capital market while China is continuing to make its own growth much more sustainable. Terrific. Thank you, Ginny. And let's move across to Arthur. Arthur, what is your take on, on these developments and changes in China's domestic economy? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of comments, uh, one on the short-term cyclical outlook and one on some of the longer-term issues. I think I have a slightly different perspective uh, here. I think if you look um, clearly at the cyclical outlook, uh, we had a very strong recovery, but that's topped out. Um, and so I think China is looking for stable or, or maybe slightly slower growth in the rest of the year, as, as Frederick suggested. I don't really see this as, as a big problem, and I don't think that the authorities do either. And in fact, I think one of their concerns is uh, that part of the recovery was powered by a real explosion in the property market, and they're concerned about overheating there. So if we look through the base effects, uh, what we can see is in the first quarter of this year, um, the two-year annualized growth in Chinese GDP was about 5%. So by using this two-year average, we can um, look through the, the big trough and then the big rebound because of COVID. And I think that gives us a pretty good sense of the trend growth rate of China going forward, somewhere in the neighborhood of 5%, which is a bit lower than it's been historically, but still very solid. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, as uh, uh, Frederick indicated, the um, – uh, industry and construction sector has been, um, you know, stronger than consumption. Um, consumption weakened a little bit in the first quarter because there was a bit of a, of a COVID outbreak, but we see that picking up a, a bit later in the year. Um, where I would differ a little bit is in the longer term of view. I think um, structurally, the uh, government is uh, is indeed looking forward to a new. Uh, sort of era of growth. And the way I would characterize this is that China has relied very heavily on things related to the construction sector for many years. Uh, and both because of the fact that we're probably at a, at a structural peak in housing demand and because of environmental and climate sustainability issues, uh, it is really necessary to, to pull back that reliance and find another source of investment. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that the um, that the authorities are not really do not have the concept that they need to rebalance uh, the economy away from investment driven growth to consumption driven growth. They just need to find a new investment driver uh, because their view is that you drive investment first and then consumption plays catch up. Uh, uh, to that, and I think what we're seeing is an increased emphasis on um, technological. Uh, innovation as the driver of growth. And I think the objective would be over the next five to 10 years to see uh, the baton pass from a fundamentally a construction uh, and, and heavy industry a sort of core of growth to one that is much more high tech uh, and that the productivity coming out of those high tech investments will ultimately drive consumer incomes and bring uh, uh, consumer spending in its wake. So I'm, I guess I'm a little bit more relaxed about the um, uh, you know, comparatively weak consumption growth uh, that you're seeing, because I, I think that's just a, a feature of the uh, investment-driven uh, uh, growth model that uh, that China has. Um, so I think, you know, bottom line is, yes, the cyclically, the recovery has peaked. So for the remainder of this year, we're looking probably sequentially at slightly slower growth. That probably means uh, a little bit um uh, you know, but potentially some weakness in uh, in uh, equity and equity prices, some uh, chance for bond yields to decline. Uh, in the longer term, I think what we have to look for is how successful they are at uh, shifting into this uh, high tech uh, oriented growth model. Terrific. And we'll circle around uh, 
to that uh, focus on, 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 on technological innovation with our next topic. And uh, Ginny mentioned it already, the new dual circulation policy, the centerpiece for the new five-year plan, which runs until 2025. Ginny, uh, what do you, can you illustrate for us what the reasoning is behind this policy? Yes, I think, to be honest, I, I absolutely agree, I think, with Arthur's point that perhaps consumption, um, you know, really should go hand in hand with, you know, I guess the existing models of growth, which is innovation, uh, uh, investment driven, construction driven. But at the same time, I think the dual circulation has come at a time where clearly international uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, tensions are rising. And this is not just US China. This is, um, I think, between major economies versus China, but also between all of the emerging world as well uh, with China. And of course, post COVID, every economy is going through a very different picture. And I think this differentiation in terms of um, the recovery trends within nations has really, um, I guess, accentuated the need to have a policy where China can, in some form, work with other nations. So. I think what's behind the dual circula circulation reasoning is number one, China, as I said, has abandoned this kind of quantitative um, and rapid uh, pursuing of a, um, you know, a numerical target on GDP growth towards a sustainable growth. So less of a one-off, more of a sustainable uh, reformist kind of agenda in terms of growth. Secondly, the economy will be digital innovation and consumption-led, with a reasoning that structural challenges like the demography, for example, uh, lowering productivity gains, for example, will clearly be some of the huge obstacles against sustaining that high level of growth. We will see from Western economies that will pick up this year, for example, and probably will see you know, very high and rapid levels of growth, but they will probably be one-offs, um, you know, unless these kind of a, a stimulus fueling uh, driven economy can be sustained. So I think from China's perspective, China's seeking a level, seek, uh, level playing field whereby it can co exist with some of the Western economies uh, from a trade perspective, but also from an investment perspective and integration into multilateral frameworks. And that's why RCEP, that's why uh, China EU um, trades and negotiations, etc., will come into format. And I think one of the key areas where there will be a common interest will be on green and sustainable financing, for example. As was mentioned already this morning by Minister Gramenu, who also sees an area of major collaboration between Europe and China there. So um, uh, let's follow this up with uh, Frederick. Frederick, we, we don't really know certain particular steps that are to do with this dual circulation policy just yet. We're a bit short on details. What do you think will come as next steps? Well, I think you're right. We're still trying to find out exactly, and I think policymakers themselves are trying to exactly formulate a, a very precise strategy. It's an idea right now. We have the broad contours, but we don't have necessarily the specific steps. I, I would highlight two things. I, I think, as, as Ginny just mentioned, um, dual circulation is about strengthening the resilience of the Chinese economy against external challenges. And, and this uh, you know, means, for example, more investment high tech, as Arthur just said, uh, you know, a, a certain technological independence, if, if you will. Um, but it also means uh, perhaps even a further reduction on the reliance on exports, because really what the U.S.-China trade tensions have shown is that China could potentially be vulnerable if there was a, a an increase in tariffs, uh, for example, by Western economies against Chinese goods. And, and that's perhaps where I, I would differ a little bit from what Arthur just said. I do think the domestic consumption uh, story is still important within dual circulation, because if you want to get away from uh, sort of a, a greater dependence on of, of exports, you need to provide alternative demand markets. And they're trying to develop that domestically 
in the consumer space. So I think, yes, investment is important here, but it's also, you know, strengthening domestic consumption to help absorb some of the products that the investment is churning out domestically. I would also highlight that probably increasing the consumption share in GDP is also important for other reasons, and that is to satisfy the growing aspirations of the Chinese people. It's still a middle-income economy. And uh, Arthur just mentioned that the trend growth rate could fall to about 5% or so. Um, but I think it's perhaps uh, necessary that consumer spending grows faster than that over time in order to satisfy some of the aspirations of the Chinese people. And therefore, shifting gradually towards a more of a consumption-led model is probably going to be a key part of, of dual circulation as well. Terrific. Thank you for doing me the great favor of being not of the same opinion all the time, which is quite often the case with economists talking about one topic. Now, Arthur, let's give you uh, the opportunity to reply. And if you could do me a favor and also tie into your answer how this dual circulation policy sits with this uh, further focus on, on technology, because th the technology driven strategy was there already before and maybe has become amplified even more, as Ginny was saying. And also, how does it sit with foreign investment? Yeah, yeah. So um, clearly, I mean, the dual circulation strategy, I, I agree with Frederick, was driven to a very significant extent by a desire to uh, create a, um, a buffer um, against increased friction with trade partners. Uh, and the idea basically is that um, because of political reasons, it, uh, integration with the with global markets is is a little bit riskier now, um, and so therefore China does need to have a so-called internal circulation model, uh, which means uh, both greater internal domestic demand, uh, so that you don't have to be so ex uh, reliant on export demand, um, and also greater self-sufficiency in. Uh, key technological products, because one of the things that they found in the trade war, particularly with sanctions against Huawei, is that a lot of China's tech companies are actually quite vulnerable to restrictions uh, on technology um, inputs uh, from the United States. And so this sits, I think, within a larger uh, strategy that the government um, has been developing over the last several years, which is called the Innovation Driven Development Strategy. Uh, and this includes policies such as the Made in China 2025 uh, industrial policy and, and other things. And again, the idea is to um, have the state sort of act as almost a kind of a, kind of a big uh, venture capital fund where they sort of identify key sectors for develop then mobilize funding not only from the central government, but also from um, a private capital markets, from state-owned enterprises, and from foreign uh, investors and foreign companies um, to accelerate the development of, you know, semiconductors, uh, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, a whole host of new new industries. Um, so this has been sort of brewing for several years, and I think the dual circulation strategy is sort of a, a reemphasis, if you will, that a, a big part of the goal here is for China to have greater self-sufficiency um, in uh, some of the sort of the key uh, technological elements of the modern economy. And I think where foreign companies fit into this is that the Chinese government recognizes that there's a lot of technology that exists out in the world. It does not really exist in China yet. So you need to have a, a relatively open door policy for high tech uh, uh, foreign companies, also for you know foreign institutional investors who may want to invest in tech startups in China. So you've seen, uh, I think, a continued opening of China's uh, market to foreign companies. Um, and uh, a continuing uh, relaxation of barriers to um, you know, entry through the capital markets. And that's all part of this, I think, integrated strategy to, to upgrade uh, technology. And from the standpoint of the foreign companies, uh, it's very important to be in China because China is increasingly a, a hub, a global hub of innovation, I think second only to the United States. So if you want to be globally competitive, as a firm in any kind of technology-intensive industry, you really have to be in China. 
And of course, what you just mentioned there, Arthur, thank you about the integration of China's capital markets in the rest of the world. We'll uh, dedicate our whole day tomorrow to. But uh, let's then widen out the perspective. China's economy, economy integrating with the global context. We had the previous panel cover the geopolitical angle. Let's look at this uh, from an economic uh, angle. According to some metrics, uh, we already touched upon, China overtook the United States as its largest trading partner, specifically for goods. But maybe the data doesn't quite show the full picture yet, or it's a one-off due to the uh, disproportionate impact of the pandemic. Um, Frederick, let me ask you, how do you think the balance between these three economic power zones is going to shape up in the future? Well, there's a lot of been talked about about supply chain disintegration and how, you know, the greater economic tensions globally kind of lead to shortening of supply chains, re-onshoring, etc. We think this is a bit overdone. If you look at investment flows, for example, not trade flows, which are distorted by the pandemic, but foreign direct investment, which is a long term commitment by companies that is still very strong cross border. Uh, into China, out of China. So there's still an element here of intense connectedness despite these tensions. I would actually argue that the bigger changes that these tensions are, are, are bringing are uh, changes in domestic policy in the Western world because the realization now that perhaps there's a greater need for competing with China. Uh, and so there is there's more of a domestic policy change than really a change to international trade flows and foreign direct investment. Um, one last point to make is that, and that's a clear trend, is that we've seen growing regionalization as well. Uh, so actually, uh, by some measures, China's largest trade partner now is actually ASEAN. Um, and that is because of the bilateral relationship between the ASEAN economies and China. The supply chains are integrating. So we're seeing a regionalization of trade here in Asia. Um, that doesn't preclude strong relations with the EU and US, but that certainly is going to be a key trend, I think, that will continue for, for the next several years. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, I know Ginny is going to pick up on just what you said in a minute, but I first want to give Arthur the, uh, the opportunity to uh, reflect on that question from the U.S. perspective. So what, what, is, what is your take on that rebalancing in that triangle, EU, uh, China and United States? Arthur. Yeah, well, I think it's very clearly the case that in the United States you have a political, um, a politically driven desire uh, to reduce the interdependence of the U.S. and the Chinese economies and to try to encourage uh, companies to invest less or rely less in the Chinese market uh, and hopefully invest more at home. And, you know, like Frederick, I, I see that, you know, there's a little bit of this going on. But frankly, um, when you talk to the companies, they have very, very powerful incentives to be in China. It's a fast growing market. Um, it's really a uh, an unmatched uh, production base in terms of the combination of efficiencies and costs. Um, it's proven very adaptable and resilient to shocks, um, as as the quick recovery from COVID showed. Um, and as I mentioned, it's also a really important place to be if you are uh, interested in staying uh, up to speed with the global innovation cycle. So you, what you have in the U.S. is a kind of tug of war between people on the national security side who are trying to uh, reduce the economic engagement with China and people in the business side who really say that that is simply not an option. Um, and I think the, the what will be interesting to see is that the approach that the Biden administration has been taking, a little bit different than the Trump administration, uh, is to try and forge, you know, uh, better relations with Europe and in countries in Asia with the idea that you can have a sort of a, a coordinated effort to um, uh, kind of rearrange the the economic relationships with China. And again, I think that's going to be difficult because if you look at Europe, the balance of commercial and strategic interest is very different than it is in the United States. The United States has a very, very strong security strategic concern about the rise of China. I think uh, that exists in Europe, but it's much more limited. And there, there tends to be a much more, uh, a stronger focus on the on the necessity of keeping good commercial relationships with China. Um, so on the whole, yeah, I think uh, we're going to see a, a continuation of deep commercial engagement with China with at the margin 
uh, efforts, uh, probably led by the U.S., to try and um, uh, constrain the ability of China, particularly in technology-oriented fields, to sort of influence the global uh, marketplace. Uh, and it will be uh, difficult to, you know, difficult to predict how that will how that will pan out. Um, but I think the, the the tug of war between the security interests and the business interests. In the United States, that's now just a permanent feature of the landscape, and we're going to be living with that for, for some years to come. Okay, terrific. Now let's go back to the point uh, Frederick was just making um, a, a little while ago with ASEAN as such an important, or having grown to such an important trading partner for China. Ginny, um, you're very closely also looking at the economic developments along the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And now in November 2020, um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was signed between the 10 members of ASEAN and Australia, China, Japan, Korea, and New New Zealand. So can you give us your perspective on how China's regional in economic integration is proceeding? I thank you for that question. Uh, I think we haven't really talked much about Belt and Road and, and indeed, of course, these kind of global fat south and China, the interaction between emerging economies and China. What you'll find is that some of those economies recovering fastest um, from the pandemic, clearly, obviously, there are still ongoing uh, COVID-19 concerns. Um, but really, what we've discovered is that China will have greater impacts on global supply chains. So I get the point the other two speakers were talking about the resilience and China becoming more self-dependent or self-sufficient in terms of um, its own supply chains. But I think the interaction between China, Belt and Road uh, uh, countries, not only those who are officially on the Belt and Road, of course, we know that Belt and Road is a, almost an open concept. It is a platform where all countries, I guess, could come together and, and think about um, efficient ways forward. Um, and I think um, when it comes to RCEP, very interestingly, when we think about China's recent developments, whether it's RMB, internationalization, so currency, trade, and also investment, China tends to test it out with its neighboring partners. So, of course, RCEP is hugely important, but just from a trading partner's perspective, many of those already have China as their top trading partner. So, of course, without a doubt, this RCEP con concept will be hugely important for China and the rest of the members. But I think for capital markets, financial markets, the key thing is whether this regionalization can be embedded into a much more multilateral framework. And I think Arthur um, and Frederick also talked about how the three largest economies will work together. And I think the key here is to define areas where there can be common interests and where there will be very stringent um, uh, rule-based uh, uh, cases where China and the, these uh, other nations can work together. So I think when it comes to flows, um, when it comes to areas of cooperation, I actually see more room for regional and multilateral or global cooperation in particular areas. But from China's perspective, I think um, when it comes to working with its neighboring countries, it's more about perception of China, how changing perceptions of China is going to be important important, not just the existing relationship between China and these countries. Wonderful. Thank you. So to wrap it all up, I want to circle back to our start at the outset, that economic growth outlook. Let's do a lightning round, just one or two lines from each of you. What are you expecting in terms of growth outlook for the full year and maybe beyond for China? So let's start with Frederick. Well, this year is an easy target to push growth above, uh, well above eight percent because of base effects. The Chinese have set themselves a six percent uh, target, which will be easily beaten. But uh, I think, as Arthur said, the underlying growth rate is more like five percent, and that's really where China is settling. And that's a good thing because it means we're finally finally focusing on the quality of growth, and that's really the mantra going forward in China. Arthur, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key question is, um, you know, we're looking most likely at a trend growth rate in, in the neighborhood of 5% for the next several years. And then I think the key question is what the composition of that growth is. And number one, are they successful in making um, 
uh, technology-driven productivity improvements a core part of that growth, um, or uh, do they continue to struggle with the, the problem that they've had for the several years, past several years, which is that a lot of the growth has been driven by leverage in the financial system. They're trying very hard to contain financial leverage, um, and they're already uh, sort of in tightening mode. Um, uh, modestly on on the on the financial side, so I think watching rate of technological progress and the success in the battle against leverage mm -hmm. uh, will be the key uh, criteria for understanding the quality of growth. Fantastic! And Ginny, you have the last word. What's your take on the outlook? I agree with the other speakers in that it's almost becoming less meaningful to forecast the headline GDP figure in China. And I think we will continue to see softer targets. For me, the key is to have household income, real uh, household uh, disposable income growing at a faster rate than headline GDP. And we haven't seen that for a very, very long time. And I think that will be the key challenge. And when it comes to monetary policy normalization, it is about the spillover effects. And that that's why we're seeing the regulators and authorities battling with asset price inflation and the fear of financial risk and contagion. So clearly, uh, debt will continue to be a problem. But really reining in the debt that we're still seeing that is being digested of, uh, at the aftermath of financial crisis. And of course, recent debt are piled on by corporate uh, institutions, I think will be hugely important. And I think that will be a key measure of China's success for a growth and development. Terrific. Thank you so much to all of you, Ginny in London, Arthur in New York, and then Frederick over in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just to briefly wrap up a quick conclusion uh, to take away. So our panel sees growth to come through for this year and possibly the foreseeable future in a, must, a more softer and more balanced way with trend growth rate of 5% with a rotation towards domestic con consumption and a, a strong policy focus on building resil resilience and investing in technological innovation. And this leads us directly into our uh, last piece of the day because our final topic will be a focus on China's digital economy, which is becoming a key driver for economic growth already. Before um, COVID-19 in 2019, uh, the digital economy accounted for a third of its GDP and will focus specifically on Chinese e-commerce and fintech, both together uh, being, if you will, an ecosystem that exists only in this way in China at this point, and it's way more than just online shopping. It combines retail with mobile communication, with social networking, and a whole range of financial services, specifically in the fintech area. And just to uh, give you two data points, before COVID-19, uh, China accounted for 45% of all global e-commerce transactions, while mobile payments penetration was three times higher compared to the next largest market, the United States. That's according to research by McKinsey back from November last year. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, businesses and consumers in China, like in other countries, doubled down on digitization. And they there is no sign that this trend is changing anytime soon, despite a reopening of brick and mortar retail. And at the same time, we're seeing a tightening of regulatory scrutiny in regards to those big e-commerce and fintech giants uh, to ensure more transparency and fair competition. So to talk us through the latest on what's happening in this dynamic uh, ecosystem in China, I have the pleasure to welcome back yet another familiar face at the China Finance Finance Forum. He's Zenon Capron, a recognized expert in the field of fintech in China. He has been serving the financial industry for more than 20 years, and he's indeed founder and director of a Capron Asia leading financial research um, firm with offices across Asia and also in China. Welcome, Zenon.
Hi there, Zenon. Good to have you back at the China Finance Forum. I hope you're well. Now, talk us through what's new in fintech and e-commerce and how the industry responded to the pandemic last year. Thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure to be at the China Finance Forum. I think you know, when we look back at fintech in China over the past decade, it never ceases to disappoint in terms of the the level of interest, the growth, the penetration of all these new products and services that come, are coming to market. And over the past two years, it's been uh, no surprise about a lot of the changes and challenges that it's faced. Although there have been some different approaches that the government has taken towards fintech in China. I think the first thing to obviously look at is, is around everything that's happened with COVID, how the industry responded to that, uh, you know, in many ways, China was ready for COVID before many other countries were because so much of the financial ecosystem was already digital. And then increasingly looking at the regulatory aspects, of course, over the past year, we've seen a lot of pushback on the large fintech companies like Ant Group and Tencent in China. And that's having implications about how fintech is going forward in the development in mainland China. As you just mentioned, uh, the regulators are getting a bit uh, tougher on those tech giants. So what does it mean specifically for fintech in this field? Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, I think we probably talked about this last year at the at the forum, but it was actually a bit surprising of how much China has cracked down on these fintech companies. I mean, when you look at companies like Ant Financial, now Ant Group, and the impact that they've had on financial inclusion and just economic empowerment across the country, it's not a hyperbole to say that these companies have impacted China's GDP by providing economic empowerment and access to financial products and tools across the country. When you tie those in with existing platforms like e-commerce, you can really see the impact that they've had. But you know the the tension between the government and the fintech companies has always been there, and it's always this kind of cat and mouse game to ensure that uh, innovation is happening, but at a pace that the government feels comfortable with. And and we were quite surprised, to be honest, with the the level of regulation that the Chinese government has brought to market. If you had asked us at the beginning of 2000 what we thought, we would have said, look. Chinese government has largely put in a lot of the regulations in place around lending and payments and e-commerce and fintech in general. But apparently there was still more to come. And we've seen the pushback of Ant's uh, IPO and now some increased restrictions on how their uh, businesses can operate as well as the creation of a holding company for that. So the government seems to have hit a point where they feel that the risk that's coming out of this innovation within the Chinese finance fintech ecosystem is more than they're comfortable with. And so they're really pushing it and kind of putting it back in a box, so to speak. Since you just mentioned innovation, is this regulatory tightening um, having an effect on innovation at all? What do you think is going to happen going forward? I think a lot of that, if you read the media, is a little bit overblown. I think, you know, when you look at these companies like Ant Group and Tencent, they are at the beginning tech companies and innovation is at their core mindset. And you can compare them to uh, Western companies, and I'm sure there's pluses and minuses between them. But fundamentally, the things that Ant Group and Tencent and the other fintechs have done to really change the market and the nature of payments and wealth management uh, is, is, is very remarkable. And, uh, you know, just because they're being regulated in a different way, it doesn't mean that innovation disappears. It may slow down slightly. We may see more controls around the products and services that they launch. But fundamentally, the, the core of those companies is, and one of the reasons they've been so successful is because they are innovative. And, and when you compare it to the incumbent providers in China and many markets around the world, many of the traditional financial institutions are hampered by slow decision-making, legacy infrastructure, and a lot of challenges internally that companies like Ant Group and Tencent don't necessarily have. So there has been a lot of talk about how innovation will be throttled. It's probably true insofar that it will be throttled somewhat, but we don't, we don't think that that is the end of fintech in China, but rather a new direction that it needs to go. And what specifically does it mean for those champions you just mentioned, like uh, Tencent and Financial? Will we still see those big champions in this field? 
I think certainly we will. I think one of the things that uh, many people overlook is the customer experience that you get with these apps and these platforms. Uh, you know, there's a reason why people use WeChat or Alipay instead of a card. It's just because it's much more convenient. Like if you're trying to make a card payment in China, you have to uh, tap your card. Oftentimes you have to insert it, type in a pin and do a signature. And that transaction can take up to a minute once it, the information is going back and forth between the issuing bank and the merchant. Whereas with uh, QR codes and Alipay and WeChat Pay, it's a much more seamless transaction. It's a 10 second transaction. And that customer experience, when you look across all of the different elements of their financial ecosystem, is just very difficult to match. Uh, to give you an idea, I mean, we, for corporate bank in China, in order to make a payment, we have uh, four passwords and two USB sticks that we need to make a payment. And we bank with what's seen as one of the more innovative and forward-thinking banks in China. And, and you compare that to an Alipay or WeChat Pay. If I want to pay a friend, I just tick on them in WeChat and I say transfer funds. And it's it's done very quickly. So that convenience and that customer experience will keep people coming back to these platforms. Now, of course, as we already heard at the outset of the conference, uh, the state is very active as well. China is a first mover as far as um, a digital currency is concerned. We heard earlier from the representative of the People's Bank of China in Frankfurt uh, uh, what, what they're planning and how they're staging it with pilot projects and you know building a whole ecosystem and regulatory framework around that. What do you think now from your perspective as an analyst who has been covering that market for for a long, long time, what is the primary reason that China is pursuing setting up a digital currency, the ECNY, as he called it? Look, in, in my view, governments around the world, if they had the choice, would move to central bank digital currencies. It gives a lot more transparency, ability to regulate and to control flows within the ecosystem, and, and you know, more, more surveillance on what individuals or companies are doing. Uh, China is just certainly a first mover in this respect. And and what, what's interesting about China is the fact that it's a capital controlled currency as well. So that makes the challenges around creating a central bank digital currency a little bit more um, acute than they would be in other markets because that has to be controlled for, especially in the overseas side of things. Um, so a lot of people look at the the kind of big brother view of central bank digital currencies and in particular the EUN and, and the monitoring that could have on the individuals. But there are also some good aspects to it as well. Uh, it is what's so-called a programmable currency. So one of the challenges that the Chinese government has had in the past is providing funding towards small and medium enterprises. So if they give you know a trillion dollars to Chinese banks and say, go lend this to SMEs, sometimes that money doesn't land in the pockets of SMEs, but it lands in the pockets of SOEs, state-owned enterprises and the larger companies. Now, why is that? Because those companies are too big to fail. And, and because the interest rate market is quite competitive on lending, you know, you could lend to Zenon for 7% or you could lend to PetroChina for 6.5%. You're probably going to lend to PetroChina. So with the nature of a uh, central bank digital currency, the Chinese government can actually program that. So if you think about that in that context, if they have a trillion RMB program that they're channeling towards small medium enterprises, they could earmark that digital currency such that it doesn't activate until it's in the wallets of these small medium enterprises, which is a great boon because it makes you know their ability to actually drive funding where it needs to be going rather than it being lost in the commercial bank system is, is a very strong aspect of that. And then of course, you know, as China moves beyond the domestic use cases and looks at cross-border use cases, it makes the fungibility of the renminbi um, much easier. You know, currently we have clearing banks in, in several different markets, several different offshore RMB markets around the world, London, Toronto, Hong Kong, et cetera. But now effectively it becomes a global currency insofar that if anybody is able to download a wallet, they'll instantly be able to track, uh, can, uh, transact in eRMB, which is a big opportunity for the government to expand the influence of the RMB globally, although we don't see it having a tremendous impact on the RMB becoming an international trade currency um, and certainly not uh, surpassing the US dollar in that respect. Now, we've seen quite a bit of reporting following this um, innovation of the digital RMB and, and how uh, the PBC is planning those steps and pilot programs. And just to remind our audience, um, there are no plans to roll it out internationally. But if you happen to attend the Winter Olympics, it will be usable also for foreign visitors on the ground in mainland China. But Zenon, um, what does it mean for other countries to have China, China as first mover in this field? 
should maybe the, the EU or the United States or the United Kingdom be worried in some regard? That was sort of the underlying context of what you could perceive through various streams of reporting. Certainly the media has picked up on that point. I think when you look at the challenges for the renminbi, just the fact that it's available doesn't mean necessarily it's going to replace any of the currencies. I mean, the, the reason why uh, the US dollar is such a strong reserve currency and is the kind of the global reserve currency is the fact that uh, the US government and the economy is the biggest in the world. And, uh, you know, most commodities around the world are priced in US dollars. So until things like gold and oil are, are changed to other currencies, like perhaps ERM and B, are priced in other currencies besides the ERM and B, I, I think for the, for the near term, the US dollar will remain king in that respect. Uh, one element that is interesting is how the ERM and B could tie in with the Belt and Road Initiative. A lot of that lending, at least initially in the Belt and Road Initiative, Initiative is in RMB. So conceivably, we could see that lending change to e RMB and then small ecosystems about, you know, when they're building a port in Africa, as an example, maybe the workers there want to spend e RMB rather than the local currency. And, and so there may be small ecosystems of e RMB usage uh, that expand internationally. But it all depends on how the government. Uh, decides to open this up to the international audience. As you mentioned before, you know, the, and we heard from the previous speaker is that the focus is really domestically right now. And it's, they're going to make sure that that is perfected before they expand internationally, certainly. So circling back to the whole field of e-commerce and fintech, uh, looking to the future, what are you expecting is going to come out of uh, this field? Look, I, I, the regulators aren't done yet. I think that's the first thing to be aware of is that, you know, Ant Group was kind of singled out as, it, I mean, it is the largest player in the fintech space, but it was also singled out as a little bit of a scapegoat. And this is kind of, um, you know, you kill the chickens to scare the monkeys, I think they say. And, and this is the first in many kind of... Uh, reviews of business practices, anti-competitive behavior that we're seeing across the technology spectrum in China right now, not just around fintech, but in all and what all of the technology companies are doing. So I think we'll continue to see that. I don't think the government is done looking at that. So there will probably be about a year where we don't see a tremendous amount of change in the fintech landscape in China in terms of new innovation. I think the, the main companies will be trying to um, you know, get their houses in order, uh, get their business business models aligned with the new regulation and, and the requirements that they're being put in place by the government for individual companies and for the industry as a whole. And then we'll see them start to um, start to move into new areas and start to innovate again. So I think the biggest thing right now, certainly from the China fintech space, is the central bank deterrency. Uh, you know, we, we've, as as was mentioned earlier, and, and you had you had indicated at the beginning, and there are many trials that are happening right now across China. And when you look at the Chinese context, there's pretty much no other society in the world that is so used to interacting digitally. Uh, you know, the, the use of cash in China and retail transaction has, has dropped dramatically over the past decade and continues to do so. With 75% of the population uh, having smartphones, it enables that new kind of e-commerce transactions, whether it be, you know, actual e-commerce or just retail commerce, where there are hundreds of millions of people that are used to using these tools every day. Effectively, once these platforms or once the central bank digital currency, the e and b integrates into Alipay or WeChat Pay, for most of the consumers in China, they won't notice much of a difference. They'll have a different wallet they could select in the app, but effectively, they're still making digital payments and they're still going out about their business in, in an everyday manner. And so certainly the, the e and b the central bank digital currency of China, is the focus for the next year and, and will be, the government will really be trying to make sure that there's no challenges around that. And what about international expansion? Is that a priority at all? Yes, the Chinese fintechs have always struggled a little bit in their international expansion. I think, you know, we've seen Ant Group come into Southeast Asia here, and it's kind of a little bit unclear about how successful they've been. Similarly, Tencent, uh, Ping An have made investments around the region. And we haven't seen a lot of high profile exits. Uh, you know, that being said, Tencent's venture capital arm, I think, is performing almost as good as the rest of the businesses altogether. So they are making smart investments. But in the fintech space, the impact is relatively limited. And I think now with so much, uh, so many challenges at home, I think the 
we'll see a lot less international expansion, at least in the next couple of years, or a lot less focus on international markets as they try to shore up everything at home first and, and get in line with what the regulator is looking for. So, you know, I think that doesn't mean that we won't see um, Alipay be accepted in Luxembourg and Paris and around uh, around Europe, but we the expansion beyond that might be a little bit slower than we would have expected in the past. And last not least, to look specifically to this year, 2021, we're expecting solid growth again coming especially out of China as sort of being the, the key driver of global growth alongside the United States, which uh, is catching up. So specifically in this, in this red hot dynamic economic field in China, what do you expect out, to come out of the fintech and e-commerce field in terms of a surprise for this year? Yeah, I guess if I had the perfect surprise, I'd hopefully be working for one of these companies. But, you know, I think the tech ecosystem and the fintech ecosystem have, have always surprised us with their innovation. And I think it may come a little bit more from the tech ecosystem in general rather than fintech for the next couple of years. You know, the way that people use platforms, things like TikTok from ByteDance. TikTok in many countries around the world is becoming a tool of e-commerce. If you look at the way that's being used in India, you know, you have e-commerce transactions that are at least being initiated on the platform and people are communicating on the platform and educating on the platform. Education is a big part of the market for TikTok in India. So there's a lot of use cases that China has really innovated on and has been first to market on that I think we'll continue to see those use cases grow most likely domestically in China as kind of a test use case. But then, you know, when we have certain examples like TikTok, that's, you know, very, very popular overseas as well. There will be some export of some of these new technology and e-commerce models that, that really catch on in other markets around the world. So going back to the beginning of the pandemic, how much did fintech contribute to getting the country through the COVID-19 um, restrictions and precautions? Yeah, certainly. I think when we look back at COVID uh, and its impact on China, it was very severe at the beginning. And and with people locked down, you know, we had staff that were locked in their houses for, for months on end in various different cities around China. And it was a big challenge. But in the background during that entire time, the fintech companies were playing a huge role in continuing to enable the economy to function, to continue to be able to, for individuals to you know, get food, access their finance, and and behave, you know, all as best they could given the circumstances that they were in. And and companies like Ant Group and Tencent were critical in that. You know, in many ways, China was much more ready for that kind of pandemic and that kind of lockdown than many other countries around the world. Uh, China has a very robust e-commerce ecosystem. Uh, the supply chain within the country has, has been built out quite a bit over the past decade. And then the financial tools that they have through these digital platforms really helped individuals and, and more importantly, the small and medium enterprises get through this. And the lending functions that um, are provided on Alipay, MyBank, and, and then Tencent's WeBank is were really critical for small medium enterprises to especially the ones that were more offline businesses to be able to borrow the money to to get through the crisis to start to deliver their products to start to digitize i mean in many ways if you look at just in in the simple case of alibaba's rural e-commerce uh efforts over the past decade, they've really gone into rural communities and help offline businesses digitize. And that was even pre-COVID. So you can imagine those tools, those techniques, those, those ways of bringing people online were, were very effective during the COVID period. And, and, and certainly, I think, if those platforms hadn't been there, the impact of COVID would have been much worse than it was. Terrific. Certainly lots to learn for other countries as far as digitization is concerned, certainly in Europe. Thank you so much, Zenon. Thank you. And uh, this concludes the first day of the China Finance Forum 2021. Just a brief recap. What did we learn today? We learned how China will continue to be the growth engine, if you will, alongside the US, which is catching up for the global economy. But that growth is likely to come in softer with a trend growth of about 5% and take on a more sustainable, a more inclusive quality, will be more led by domestic uh, uh, consumption and also more 
more technological innovation. And I think we just heard really brilliantly from Zenon how, how this growth is being underpinned by evolution in the tech sector, in the area of e-commerce and uh, fintech. Uh, another concern is, of course, building resilience and strengthening independence. We heard, of course, also about the geopolitical complexities in the Triangle Europe, China and the United States and the concerns and the hopes around the comprehensive investment agreement. But for the time being, it was also said that these, despite these complexities, that business is thriving with, with uh, mostly double-digit growth last year, as Jörg Wutke said. And I just remind the audience of Minister Gramenia's wise words about the tripod's symbolism for stability as a hopeful metaphor for the future of this triangle between Europe, China and the United States. And likewise, as we heard earlier, the data is truly showing us that the internationalization of China's capital markets continues in leaps and bounds. And I encourage you to look up the study that we reported about earlier, commissioned by Luxembourg for Finance, with the title, Beyond the Challenges, the Strength of Sino-European Ties. And two takeaways for me there that stood out of all foreign holdings of Chinese equities, European investors account for 70%, so more than two thirds, as of June last year. And specifically, Luxembourg stands out as a gateway for the global investment community seeking exposure to Luxembourg. Uh, Luxembourg accounts for almost, uh, seeking exposure to China, of course, uh, Luxembourg accounting for almost 46% of global investment allocated to, to China. So tomorrow we will investigate the motivations and reasons behind these flows, how access channels are being refined, uh, which investment topics are standing out, for example, ESG investing. And of course, we'll also mark, as I said at the outset this morning, the 10-year anniversary of the first dim sum bond listing here at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange with the former CEO of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, Robert Schaffer, who will be, us, uh, will, be, will be with us tomorrow. So join us tomorrow. Again, look out in your email box for another email coming in with a new stream for day two of the China Finance Forum. Thank you from all of us here in the studio for being with us today. Be well, be healthy, and I see you again tomorrow sharp at 9 a.m. in Luxembourg and 3 p.m. in China. See you tomorrow.